begin with a word of prayer today. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from Mark chapter 9. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another, who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We are continuing to read from the book Discipleship, Living for Christ in the Daily Grind, by J. Heinrich Arnold, a reminder that the words are the author's, not my own, but I share them with you today. What is true and unconditional surrender? A person may yield to a stronger person or an army to a stronger army. One may yield to God because he is almighty or because one fears his judgment. None of this is full surrender. Only if one experiences that God is good and that he alone is good is it possible to surrender to him unconditionally one's whole heart, soul, and being. When a person has surrendered to God with heart and soul, he will then seek others in whom the same love is clearly expressed and surrender to them also. But he can commit himself to others only if his first commitment is to God. If we ever found a group, even if it were a much smaller group than ours, where the love of Jesus was, fully, was expressed more fully and clearly than it is among us, I hope and believe that we would want to join them, even if it meant losing our particular culture or identity. God must lead us to the point where we recognize how wretched and weak we are, yes, how poor in spirit and completely helpless. Whoever feels even the least bit strong must have his weakness revealed to him. When God shows us how wretched and poor we actually are, we feel completely helpless before him. But then he helps us with his grace and strengthens us with his unending love. We are absolutely dependent on God, on Christ, and on the Holy Spirit. There is no other help. Surrendering to the will of Jesus means becoming one with him and with one another. Jesus fought so hard to surrender his will to the fathers that he sweated drops of blood. Evil powers surrounded him and tried to cause his downfall, but he remained faithful. His attitude was, thy will, not my will. This should be our attitude too in all questions, even if we are persecuted for our faith. Whatever happens, imprisonment or even death, we should say thy, say, thy will, not my will. Christ says, you did not choose me, I chose you. I appointed you and put you in your place. You shall go and bear fruit, fruit that shall last. This is so very important. I put you in your place. How often a person causes terrible harm when he is not satisfied with his place in life. Such dissatisfaction leads to hatred. We should love one another and accept the place God has given each of us. When Jesus sent two disciples to fetch a donkey's colt on Palm Sunday, they had no other task in the whole world more important than fetching it. If someone had said to them, <coughs> excuse me, 
You are called to greater things. Anyone can fetch a donkey. And they had not done it, they would have been disobedient. But there was nothing greater for them at that moment than to fetch the donkey for Christ. For myself and for each individual, I wish that we might do every task, great or small, in this obedience. There is nothing greater than obedience to Christ. Jesus calls each of us to be humble. If a person seeks human greatness, Christian community is not the place for him. Any of us might be tempted by ambition, but we must take an attitude against such temptation. It is good to be weak. Our human weakness is no hindrance to the kingdom of God, as long as we do not use it for an excuse for our sins. Read 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, where Paul writes that the Lord will show himself in the most glorious way through our weakness. Certainly, this is not the most important passage for the church as a whole, but it is perhaps the most important passage in the Bible as regards personal discipleship. In reading the letter of Mark, I have been struck by how Jesus emphasizes our need for humility. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This must be our way too, even though we know we fall very short of fulfilling it. The Beatitudes do not call for great saints who shine in the world, but for lowly people. If you know you are sometimes critical and lack humility, then seek humility. Humility is a virtue that one can decide for. It softens the heart and makes a person open for God. Criticism is not necessarily wrong. It can be positive, but it can also be very destructive. We should not think too much about our small hearts or our weak characters. No one is pure and good except Jesus. His is the only real, really healthy character, and in his unending mercy he can purify our hearts for his purpose. Let us give ourselves to him so he can lead us and use us as he will. Let us turn our back on the temptation of Cain, who envied his brother's closeness to God. Let us be joyful in simply belonging to Jesus and willing to let him place us where we can bear the most fruit to the glory of God. If we accept the weakness and smallness of our lives in a way that leads us to humility before God, we will recognize that our only help lies in complete surrender to him and dependence on him. It might be a very painful recognition, but the victory will be life. Paul says, there must be no room for rivalry and personal vanity among you. He does not only mean the vanity of wanting to look beautiful, which is also unchristian, but the religious vanity of people who want to shine among men and be honored by them. There should be no room for such vanity among us. He continues, you must humbly reckon others better than yourselves. That is the opposite of wanting to outshine one's brother or sister. If we want to follow Jesus, how can we want to make ourselves great or important? Jesus humbled himself and in obedience accepted even death, death on a cross. How important it is that our life is genuine and remains genuine and that we do no more, but also not the least bit less than God requires of us at any moment. There is a danger of coming to an intellectual recognition of the truth and then living a life that conforms to it when the truth is not yet actually given by God into our hearts and souls. Let us never use religious words when we do not mean them. If we speak admiring, admiringly about discipleship but resist its demands at the same time, it will harm our soul and our inner life. Let us be reserved with religious terms and expressions of faith. Using them without meaning will destroy us, and our hypocrisy will be especially disastrous for our children. Jesus warns us sharply against trying to appear devout in other people's eyes. Let us be genuine and say what we truly think, even if we are off the mark, rather than use the right words without meaning them. 
According to old Jewish tradition, the high priest uses the name Jehovah only once a year on the Day of Atonement, and then only in the Holy of Holies in the Temple. For us, such reverence in the use of religious words is an important form of inner chastity. We are very cautious in using God's name. It is important to be straightforward and honest about your true feelings. Rather be too rude than too smooth, too blunt than too kind. Rather say an unkind word that is true than one that is nice but untrue. You can always be sorry for an unkind word, but hypocrisy causes permanent harm unless special grace is given. The youth movement, in which our community has its roots, was marked by a, a search for what was genuine, and though it was not a religious movement, there was something of Jesus alive in it. The first question people asked was not whether a thing was right, good, or true, but whether it was genuine. They preferred to have someone innocently say something incorrect or awkward than to have to listen to insincere religious speeches. They rejected parrot-like religion. They struggled to find the truth. From deep within people's hearts, there arose a new approach to life, a new feeling for life that expressed itself in many ways. The inward urge led to fellowship in hiking, singing, and folk dancing and even in communal settlements. A gathering around a blazing fire became a deeply felt inner experience, and the rhythmic movement of a circle dance brought to expression something from the depths of the heart. There was an effort to give shape only to what was truly genuine, and it meant rejecting all human pretense, including fashion. The inner experience was all important, and it found vivid expression in every area of life. It is not the obvious sinner who stands in the way of God. God's greatest enemies are those who receive and accept Christ's call to discipleship, but then, despite their use of religious language, continue to serve Satan at the same time. Most of Jesus' parables deal with such people, not with people of the world. The ten virgins in Matthew 25 all go out to seek the bridegroom, but five of them fall asleep. And in Matthew 24, the servant is appointed by his master, but becomes unfaithful, and so on. That is what hinders God's kingdom the most, when those who have heard his call and answered it go on to serve Satan while still using Christian words. If we stay close to Jesus, we, we will find genuineness in its clearest form, how sharply he speaks against the piety that tries to cleanse from the outside, how clearly he tells us that the inside must first be cleansed. Again, I've been reading from Discipleship, Living for Christ in the Daily Grind by J. Heinrich Arnold. Thank you for being present with us this day. And now let us end with the Lord's Prayer, and I invite you to join with whatever version you are familiar with. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.